this working right yes yes just a second Uh, I'll also switch screens to share a little bit of code. I think uh, multiple sharing is not allowed in this app. Uh, not used to Zoom a lot. So yeah, uh, just help me out uh, if I get stuck for that. Cool. I'll just start. Okay. So uh, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, Janathan, I'm audible, right, uh, guys? Yes, perfect. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Clear. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you everybody for coming. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm Nitish, and uh, today we'll be talking about uh, code sharing between web and Electron apps. Uh, just to give a little insight into uh, what we're going to cover today. Uh, I, I, I work at ClearTax, and for a couple of months, uh, we've been working on the GST desktop application. GST is one of the products ClearTax has. And uh, basically, uh, it is an Electron app, an, a hybrid Electron app. And uh, what, uh, how we've done it is, we had an, a pre-existing uh, web application over cloud. And that is what we've used to uh, create a much more powerful uh, desktop application with some desktop uh, native functionalities. And uh, we had some learning and quirks and uh, some concerns, security aspects and uh, maintainability aspects that we uh, got to learn along the way. Uh, and we thought it'll be a great idea we could share all of those things uh, in some talk. So here I am. Uh, I'll just go through uh, next things that are coming. So basically, uh, we'll discuss about uh, an existing web app. We'll take Electron. We'll add some magic or code. And we'll have some fun. So yeah, uh, that's about it. Uh, what is coming up uh, in the next 30 to 25 minutes is uh, we'll deal with uh, what Electron apps are exactly. Uh, for people who are uninitiated with Electron apps uh, and why we want to do desktops because it is, uh, you know, uh, desktop apps are not very, uh, something very in, uh, like uh, mobile apps, right? Not, not tre uh, a trend sort of thing, right? But for enterprise use case, that might actually be very useful. So yeah, we'll go through that. Uh, we'll also uh, go to different tracks we could take, different pathways we could take to do this code sharing. And we'll see what are the quirks that comes with all of these tracks. So we have three tracks actually. I'll try to cover uh, all three of them. And uh, there'll be, uh, not all of them are equally uh, long or difficult. Uh, and we'll go through the quirks and all of the issues that come along each of the path. We'll go through good, bad, and, and ugly parts of all of those. And towards the end, we'll try to summarize and get a, a you know opinionated view of uh, how we should go about things here. So yeah, uh, that is what is coming. Uh, so, uh, so why? Uh, no, not it's not hot. Uh, it is actually hot for people who want to develop a uh, desktop application. Uh, it has become a go-to platform. Initially, when Electron was released, there was a lot of concerns uh, from the community about the security aspect, about what Electron provides and how frequently it APIs keeps on changing. But uh, over time, we've seen the platform evolve so much and uh, now it is very much mature and it is widely accepted by, by the community. And for all of the uh, things that it provides, ease of building application is the most, uh, I think, uh, successful thing that has come along with Electron. So yeah, uh, I think, yeah, not it's not hard, but yeah, it's good to go with Electron, so yeah. So uh, before we, uh, again, uh, I'll ask the same question, why? Why? So uh, when you try to build an Electron app, uh, first question probably we should ask is, can we build it on web? Because web is definitely cloud is uh, cloud, right? You can access it from anywhere. You don't need to install it on your system. And it is, uh, and it is uh, you know, uh, basically accessible on mobile devices and browsers anywhere across, right? So uh, we should be asking this question actually, if we can build it on web, maybe we should not build it on desktop after all. Okay. now. Uh, what are we trying to build? Are we trying to build a browser from Electron? Uh, then Electron is definitely not the right choice. Uh, we are not trying to build a browser. We are just trying to build an application, uh, an, an application that you, were, you would have used like PowerPoint, right? Like Tally for counting. So that kind of an application. Uh, do you just want a dedicated window? Then uh, maybe again, 
electron might not be the right choice. It is heavy compared to what you might have as PWAs or just a dedicated window. So maybe build a Chrome app or something similar. So yeah, for just a dedicated window, electron might not be the right choice. Uh, so uh, all of this points to just one question. Uh, what are the capabilities that you want on your app that aren't available on web apps? So if you can answer this question well, and if you can answer this question uh, with all of the depth and thoroughness after applying like all how, how we can enable a web app to uh, have all of those capabilities, we can probably proceed with uh, developing a desktop application. So yeah, so uh, while working at GSD, uh, we had a use case where we wanted to manage downloads and uploads of over uh, 700 to uh, 1500 files at once. And that is when we started to think maybe web is not, uh, a web app might not be as powerful and managing all of the background tasks and all, right? And uh, fine tune control over things like notification and all, uh, the touch bar that has come, right? All of those things. So there were many cross platform concerns to address many native features that we wanted to access uh, to use the full capability of the platform that is provided. Right, uh, with Mac OS and Windows, right? We needed fine green control over things uh, that were just not available in browsers. So that is when we decided that we want uh, uh, an application on desktop. And that is when we wanted to move, create a desktop application. So that was our motivation. You might have yours. Uh, so uh, now, again, answering that question as to uh, what are the capabilities that you want on desktop application? Uh, that might be your biggest push. Uh, so, uh, Let's see what are the ways uh, the, where we can build these applications. So uh, today I'm focusing on uh, using Electron when you already have a web application with you in your hand, right? So let's say you own a website. For our case, we used to, we, we own cleartax.com, right? And we uh, use several sub uh, other product that comes uh, with cleartax, like gsc.cleartax.com, ewaybuild.cleartax.com. So now what we wanted to do is, uh, we did not want to write the code, uh, rewrite the code, right? We did not want to create the same application, uh, a superset of application uh, while rewriting the code. So what we did is we wanted to port the same existing application into a desktop application with much more capabilities, right? Uh, better handling of files, right? Better handling of notifications and all touch bar. So what we did is we took a methodology and we, that will be coming in uh, one of these tracks. But first I'll go through a track A, which is called the easy peasy way. Uh, so let's see what it is actually. Uh, let me just tell you that it is the easiest way to create an application, a desktop application. So I'll just talk about uh, what does the architecture look like here. So you create something called a browser window object and a render process, which is a render process basically. And then what you do is you take this browser window object and you remote your, uh, you load your remote web application into this window. What is your remote web application? It is basically your website that you built, right? For me, it was clear tax sorting, right? So what I did is I created a browser window and I loaded my application into this. Now, how, how does this look into, like, uh, what does it look like into code? We'll see, uh, probably I'll share my uh, code base, not, my, uh, not the clear tax code base, of course, I'll, create, uh, I'll share a dummy application and we'll see uh, how does it look like in the code. Uh, so what does this give actually? This gives me access to all of the APIs and power of desktop platform that comes with Electron and comes with Node basically. So uh, the idea behind this was you can access OS level feature like file system and all, and you can use all of the desktop, a desktop platform feature and get a powerful application, a super set of the application, right? So the high level architecture would look like this. There's a main process. There is a renderer process and what it is, the uh, main process basically uh, it acts as a, uh, you know, it controls all of the renderer process. Uh, to give you an, an analogy, it is like Chrome, right? Chrome is a multi-process architecture based uh, browser, right? So there is a main process and then there are tabs, right? Which are like renderer process in Electron. So these are also processes in itself, but there is a process that controls all of the, all of these processes also in some way. Right. So this is how the application will look like now. You have a main process. You've spawned a browser window. And what you've done is you've loaded your some remote URL.com site into this. And now this is an electron application. So what you've done basically is you've converted your site into an electron application. I'll just give you a little more insight into what electron is, 
so exactly what i have said right now there is a main process like chrome has a main process and there are multiple render process each of these render process can be a browser window it can be any container like a web view right uh, so all of these are controlled by main process there's always one main process and in render process you could render anything so uh, basically electron uh, combines it is it it is a combined runtime right that is provided uh, that, that is a, like basically a combination of chromium and node js right the render part part of the chromium and uh, the engine of node right pa basically so that is what electron gives us and uh, that is what we basically uh, since we have that capability from node and the rendering part is provided by chromium we can use those capabilities to build uh, capabilities that are available only on a uh, desktop right like uh, one example would be file system access right you usually don't have uh, such a good file system access on chrome there are uh, isolated uh, kind of uh, access that you could get with chrome extensions maybe you know but yeah they are not the regular file system access that you would get on an application like server side application on right so uh, this is what we get from electron i'll uh, try to show you the code uh, that will give you a little more insight into how this looks like i'll just talk about uh, okay i think just missing the slide here huh. yeah so this is what the code looks like so what you so what you are seeing here is how to create a window right so if you see this is just a few line of code right you created a function you specified height and width of the window that could appear uh what you've done is you've done something called node integration is true right and then what you've done is you've loaded a remote url here right some foobar.com or clear tax dot in maybe now what is happening here is your remote content has access to your node system right uh and what you can do here is basically whatever you want right basically once you've get gotten access to node apis and all you can do whatever you want from your remote application right because it can access uh, the globals of the node and all right so uh, that is what it will look like uh, i'll not go into code of this part of the application maybe the next part will go through it because it is actually very small and there will try to understand ki what does it look like when we try to do some something that actually works right so uh, just let me skip over this part and then when app is ready basically this is telling your app object when it becomes ready then you just create this window right but again uh, do you want to take this path there are quirks there are clear concerns here that i'll come to the next few slides but definitely this might not be such a good idea uh, let's see the good parts first uh, it is of course very simple way in just few line of code you had a desktop application up and running right so you had a web application and now you have this application uh, let me just try to or uh, share uh, my uh screen for this one in just a second uh i think it is uh, it uh, it has to be switched to show a different screen uh, i'll not go there then i'll just go to the code in the next part then uh, let's go to the earlier parts then. so Nitish, what you've done uh-huh. Nitish, do you want to try share desktop when you say share it will yeah, yeah, give you the to... whole desktop uh, you can switch to that and try it out once that way it okay. will be very easy for you to switch between Sure, sure. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, you can first stop sharing. Then, when you get the share icon, it will give you option to share complete desktop. It will give desktop or extended screen if you have. It will give two desktops. Mm-hmm. The very first one to the okay. leftmost will be the full desktop. Yeah, got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, uh, are you guys able to see my screen? Mm, it's okay. coming it's all coming this is shit so yes. if you see uh yes now so with those few line of code i just loaded a dummy site here and you can see this is exactly that site what i've done is just putting a remote site what loaded here is basically a meal app that i just downloaded from the internet and that's it uh, it is a local server running here uh, i'll just try to change this in next uh, uh, in the next Slide that I will go through. I'll just show you the code how it looks like. So we have a main file, right? And uh, we, what we've done here is we've created a window. Let me just comment this out. So this part is commented out. What you've done here is you've loaded a URL, right? Like clear text sorted or so, right? 
here i've just loaded a local file but you can share a remote file also and that's how you get to just uh, get your site up and running in a web browser uh, sorry in the electron application so this is all the line of code that you need to create a desktop application out of your website now uh, is it is it a good way to do it uh, definitely big no uh, because what are we trusting here we are trusting remote content right and remote content could be anything even if it is your content uh, you can never be so sure ki it will always be your content right there are easy way like there are uh, we already know there are ways to you know uh, uh, course and all always happens right x uh, excesses always happens right so all of those things uh, can happen right things can go wrong so should be trust remote content uh, the answer is big no right remote content uh, if you are loading it right it has full access to node electron right that is too much of a power that we are giving to a web application and that is why uh, modern browsers always implement security in that way right they don't ex expose all of these features that you shouldn't otherwise expose to a website right and that is how it is designed right so the answer is clear no you cannot trust a remote content with super powers right so uh, we are basically saying ki track is the easy peasy way doesn't work for doesn't work for us uh, on top of that uh, would you like you wouldn't definitely want to lose security for just sake of building the feature right so yeah definitely no for this one there's another uh, way to do it that is called remote isolation right and we'll go through this and this might be the way we maybe might want to build the application of course there are other ways of doing it but yeah let's go through this one first uh so uh, what we are doing here is uh, what was the problem in the last approach that we took basically we were giving unfettered access to node uh, to our remote content right so first thing we might want to do is we want to gate that access we want to provide a restricted access because after all we want our application to have that access uh, to 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 be able to do all those powerful things but securely right so first thing is we remove the unfettered access to node we we load our remote application in something called an isolated context which is basically implementation of same uh, context isolation that is provided by uh, uh, modern browsers right like chrome and all right so let's see high level architecture of this ki how this looks like uh, what we do is again we create a new browser window object and we load our remote web application into this window uh, importantly what we do is we disable node integration so my new browser window the remote content does not have access to node now right and i enable this context isolation which means it is basically running in an isolated context right uh, and then what i do is i expose a minimal api on window object via something called a preload script now we'll go into details of what this preload script is but just let me uh, put it this way it is a script that runs before your uh, content would load right browser window content would load load so before uh, loading all of those remote website this uh, script will run uh, in render before uh, the website runs right so uh, yeah exactly what i said uh, and this preload script can access node built ins and this is how you would provide so via remote uh, via this preload script you would provide all of those capabilities to a remote website right uh what we should do here is we can expose a carefully designed and a very small uh, api uh, uh just decreasing the surface area wherever possible and this should be exposed to the remote web application right so a high level architecture looks like this we are still doing the same thing we are losing uh, we are uh, creating a render process uh, uh browser window and we have created some remote url here matlab we have loaded some remote url but now what i've done is i have restricted node access now node access is limited just to the main process and this preload script and this preload script would just expose a, a window a, an object on the window right window object so uh, yeah uh, okay so basically uh, now what will happen is uh, i'll just I show you the code uh -huh. hi this some logical point uh, there are few questions uh, people may need to ask Okay. Uh -huh. uh, whenever you get a logical point, you can give a time, and then people will ask questions. Thank you. Sure, sure. Uh, guys, please stop me. I just uh, uh, I saw the message on the uh, uh, message box, so you can just stop me there and uh, point your questions. Let's do that. Uh, uh, I'll be more than happy to.
take that questions. Uh, okay, so I'll proceed for now. Uh, before, after just this, I'll take a pause and let you ask more questions. Uh, so uh, let's see the code for this one, actually. So in the main process, we've done the same thing. What we've done different is, we've taken a preload script and we've said in my preferences, I'm, uh, uh, in our preferences, uh, we'll just uh, load a preload script. I'll say node integration is false, context isolation is true. And this sandbox, which is more like the browser sandbox, right now, Chrome sandbox, Chromium sandbox that is, that is provided, did, that is also true, right? And now what I'm doing is I'm loading, loading my remote URL, right? I'll just show the code for this one, actually. It'll make things much more clearer. So what I can do here is I can just uncomment this one and comment this one probably, right? And then I can just, uh, okay, sorry. Just let me uh, restart this. It has thought reload. I just created this yesterday, so. I am assuming it is starting. Yeah, yeah. So here it is, right? So you uh, you can see clear taxes. Uh, website is loaded as a desktop application. I'll what I'll do is I'll just toggle the developer tools, right? And you can see that there is something called hide there from preload script, right? And then there are a couple of warnings that uh, we'll go through. Okay, these warnings are coming. But yeah, you've seen this has come, right? So now let me go through the code. You've done the same thing. We've created a, a window out of the remote URL. And now what we are seeing is key, there's a preload script that is running before this content, right? Now what I'll do is I'll just go to preload and show you the code there, right? So you can ignore this part basically right now. I'll just comment this out. Uh, so hi there from preload script. What it is doing is it is using common JS to access electron uh, modules, electron APIs. And then what it is doing is, it is exposing some things on window object, right? So basically what I'm seeing is window.interop is desktop true, right? This, this is just to detect if this is desktop environment. And then I'm exposing a minimal API, saying take a screenshot, right? What is taking uh, takes a screenshot doing? It is basically sending a message to my main process saying he, you do this, right? It is basically IPC, inter-process communication. It is saying this is your message and this is your parameters, right? And uh, with this, you should do something, right? Now let me go to main, right? What I've done in main is I have a minimal uh, function. What it is doing is it is taking a screenshot from remote URL, right? So if you see implementation of this, this is actually using node APIs and all to take screenshot, right? So what I've done is in my preload, I have exposed a minimal object uh, which is sort of a command, right? Uh, and here I have written handler for messaging that comes through it, right? Now what I'll do is, uh, let me just try to run this, right? Uh, now, for sure, uh, I have not implemented this as a button in the application, but what I can do is, if I do window update, uh, uh, is it visible on the screen? Let me just clear this off. I'll do window dot interop. Uh, if you see window dot interop, right? It is showing is desktop true and it is exposing an API, which is calling take screenshot. Right now, let's say I will do this dot API. And then I'll take a screenshot for HTTPS. Let's say www.cnn.com. And that's it, right? Uh, now this is doing something in background. It is trying to go to uh, cnn.com and trying to grab the screenshot there. For that, I've used Puppeter, which is again, uh, will run only a node environment, right? To just to show that. Uh, Puppeter is an automation library, by the way, uh, which can be used to automate certain things and also for testing, basically. Now, uh, let me just see if we are getting this. Oh, okay. I think this was the path. Screenshot. Is there some error? Maybe. Let me just check here. Did I change some code? Let me just wipe out everything. Oh. Okay. And then let me 
let me try to run it again so i'll just try to take screenshot again and maybe it does work okay well it looks like uh, something is broken maybe just okay um for the sake of time i'll just not go through this i'll just try to explain the code right away maybe we can try running this uh, at the end right uh, basically what it'll do is it'll try to run some node process in the background and try to take a screenshot uh, yeah so okay so let me just proceed with uh, slides for now so this is how we'll achieve uh, node uh, integration faults and context isolation right so we are not exposing all of the node apis we are exposing a minimal surface area for our remote application to work right uh now what we'll do is uh let's go through works of this thing actually uh, in preload script this is what i went through actually do something powerful and this do something powerful is just sending ipc message uh to my main app uh, main uh script and then main script is doing uh, some node specific things right and then again that can also be done in some other render process to other ipcs but yeah, for uh, sake of this discussion i will not go through that right now right so what are the good parts here uh, it is still very simple actually right uh, with just a few more line of code i was able to uh, achieve parity uh, on the day one right and uh, basically i got hold of the feature plus an enhanced feature right something that a regular web app could not have done so i was uh, no, i could have taken screenshot sorry i was not able to take screenshot right away uh, so that was something that only node like we could we, we would have implemented with node here right there are other ways of doing it also in web app probably using extensions on but yeah uh, not a website right uh, we are not using a website to do that and maybe we can do something more right uh, maybe that is not the suitable example but yeah uh, so with our existing code we have been able to achieve feature parity plus some more features right uh, what i have been also able to achieve is uh, now i can continuously deploy my app right so uh, cd is there uh, when i update my content as a remote content updates and so does the web application right uh for the, uh, the electron part of things we can always push new uh, code and create new releases and updates can there are mechanism to uh, let updates happen automatically and uh, there are delta updates also coming on electron so yeah feature parity on day one continuous deployment is still there and what you're trusting uh, is just local content right with all of the scripts that you have uh, which are locally there or you might have other render process right you can trust those but you're not trusting the remote content anymore you're saying node integration is not true there context isolation is enabled sandbox is enabled right what are the other parts uh okay so this is adding a lot of overhead actually for every render process you have a new process and you are making ipc calls also which are blocking the threads right uh, so not very performant but still fine you won't usually see a lot on maintainability aspects uh there are implicit dependencies on global scope right so what you saw is we have exposed something globally here right uh, just a second uh, please please uh, this is working no okay so uh, we have exposed uh, if i show this i say very new object right and this object is mutable right so basically what you've done is uh, you've implicitly uh, you have implicit dependencies on global scope and those are mutable so anybody can go and mutate that right and then break your contract but again since you are owning the website you are loading your content it is not a security uh, you know breach but more of okay, how would you maintain that and that is why you might need in something like obfuscated name of for that object right uh, now this because you are using isolation context approach right Uh, depending on, depending on uh, what context uh, what isolation context approach you take 
it might become a source of bugs. Like uh, web views has its own quirks, right? Uh, the web views are still not very stable, right? The, the API keeps on changing. There are issues uh, with uh, something like single sign on on web views and all. Right? So all of those things would come definitely. So uh, what is the pitfalls, right? What do you have to think very well? Uh, first and foremost, you have to expose a very minimal surface area, right? You have to design the system very well. You have to make sure that you know what you're doing, right? You should run security audits, internal audits or external audits if you want. You should create a threat model and you should identify uh, what are the security gaps. You should use toolings for that. There are toolings like electronic security and all, uh, which can help you identify what are the things that you're doing that might go wrong. Uh, there is a lot of scope for a remote code execution, right? And if you're loading something uh, which is not secure inherently over HTTP rather than HTTPS, you're always open for man in the middle attack. So yeah, that is also a problem. And since you have a way of exposing references, you should not do that, right? Otherwise, there's no point in, uh, you know, uh, doing node integration faults, right? Because now you're exposing references, like uh, I should not expose a require, right? Otherwise, it just defeats the purpose of doing node integration faults or enabling context isolation, right? You should not expose built-ins. You should not be a uh, uh, remote uh, application should not be able to modify those things, right? You should not open anything that allows for remote code execution at all, right? So yeah, anything like uh, access and all. So yeah, those things we have to take very carefully. And in the in the end, uh, you have to define a good uh, robust CSP, so content security policy. But uh, I think that is a like that is pretty much applicable for everything. Uh, that should be a standard security practice, uh, remote content over HTTPS and CSPs and all, right? So uh, how is that basically, uh, what is the verdict here? Uh, it is definitely better and it is definitely easy. Uh, if you are okay to take a little hit on performance and some on maintainability, uh, not so much on maintainability actually, you are good to go actually with this one. Uh, now let us look at a third approach. We'll come back to the second one. We'll discuss in more detail because that seems to be a very practical approach on local resources. So what are local resources? Till now what we have discussed is, you have a remote application, uh, uh, which is basically hosted on a web server. And what you're doing is you're uh, getting it over HTTPS into your desktop application, right? And your continuous deployment is continuously uh, giving you updates there. And that is, uh, as soon as you push something there, it is visible on your desktop application. Now local resources is slightly different approach from that. What we are trying to do here is, uh, we are building our application, as a separate client and it is composed of shared resources. What are these shared resources actually? I'll just go into the architecture and then you'll understand uh, properly. So before that, I'll just try to, okay. So uh, what you have here is you have your uh, modules, you have your component, you have your dependencies, right? What you've done is you've carefully designed all of those things and what you've done is you've uh, hosted in say uh, this part, right? Like a uh, NPM registry, maybe, or your uh, organization's uh, re registry, right? You have you've broken down into uh, different pieces and you've hosted that, right? And what you've done is in a web app, you've used those components to create your web app. In your electron application, you've used those uh, components and modules to create your uh, electron application, right? And now what you can do is you can import those uh, components and modules, and you can create a, uh, you know, a desktop application, right? So, uh, what does it take now? So, first important thing, right? You need a lot of decoupling here, right? Basically, you have to first thing you have to do is you have to decouple your client and server if you're not already using that model. Uh, it has to be decoupled, right? And then you have to decouple your UI and data models, right? And then you have to decouple your globally scoped dependencies like jQuery and all, right? So that it is, uh, it can be reused across, right? And uh, what you have to do is you have to extract your code, right? You have to define it very, very clearly. If you see, we have used a common JS pattern, right? In the, our Electron application. And uh, since Node is going there, I think uh, in 12, we've already gone to A6, but you have to very well define you what is, uh, uh, what type of modules and definitions are allowed where, right? So you have to extract your code, put it in correct modules. You have to modularize, you have to segregate, right? You have to create components and modules out of it and then publish it into some accessible location like a package registry 
or npm registry for example and then you're good to go right now now what you can do is you can just import them as good old dependencies and like you would do uh, in your application where you want more to use and then you create a separate client right uh, in your electron part of the application you would still use these as regular dependencies but you'll ship these with the app bundle right with your exe uh, on windows platform right or dmg on your mac platform right so what is happening now browser window is actually pointing to a local resource so you have bundled everything and you have your html file and that html is uh, calling good old javascript as regular scripts right and you're pointing to local resources so uh, what does it look like in the code again simple index.html you're just pointing it to index.html and this index.html would call all of the resources right dependent resources right like you would do in any of the html javascript css application right and that's it right i'm just adding the main uh, process all part here and skipping the rest of it uh, i'm like the dependencies would come right that script would create its own dependency graph and so on but yeah this is the basic thing that you need to do right and what does it look like in your components right basically this is how it is right what you've done is you've modularized every single component every single model right and then you've started using it right whatever models you need you just pass through those components those components are hosted and you could use it in your web application you could use it on your desktop application right and hi nitish so, ha ha janan yeah just a time check uh, are we good in terms of uh, content because we will give some time for q and a also people may be interested to learn more uh sure janan i'll just finish it in the next 5 minutes sure sure okay thank you okay thanks uh okay so what are the good parts here uh first uh, do you want to do this uh it is promising definitely it implicitly what it is doing is it is enforcing standard practices right good practices modularization right separation of concerns decoupling right all of these things are classically good to have right and this enforces that behavior basically so definitely very promising and uh, the good part is maintainability is a uh, first uh, first class citizen here now there is no duplication of effort it encourages building a loosely coupled system and it's easier to do because of the same reason right it is also performant because what you're doing is basically you're avoiding all of the memory and cpu and uh, network overhead right uh, you don't make so much of ipc call because there's no ipc call to make because if you're running everything in main process it is just rendering that and then you can segregate based on uh, background process that you want to run you can always do that so yeah we would need ipc for right purposes then right uh good parts again on security it is implicitly trusting local content only right uh, all of the contents are bundled with the application and there's no dependencies on external content so yeah good what is the pitfalls now adoption of process what you are basically saying your organization to do is uh, take a very very different drastically different approach right hosting all of the content uh, modularizing all of the these things right in a very agile and fast paced uh, team this might be a uh, overhead right might not be feasible sometimes and then you have to make calls right make architectural choices you want many repos you want to make mono repo because mono repo looks like a good choice here you you are doing all of those things that mono repo is meant for right so all of these calls needs to be taken right so it is actually a good thing to do but it comes with its own uh, practices that might not be suitable for everybody but purely from a process point of view maybe at uh, this moment of time right and the uh, bad thing you don't have continuous deployment anymore right because uh, because you're versioning so many things you your uh, desktop application will always be lagging behind your web application because your web application would be easy to like deploy right all the time but you won't get updates so soon on your desktop application because as soon as you publish a module you have to update in your desktop application and updates are not as frequent in install software as websites right so parity will not be immediate you can uh, you can always have a lag right you can you need to have some release cycle and all so that will be a problem maybe what are the other considerations basically versioning and updates for shared modules are very important you need to follow this approach right so that you know what are the dependencies breaking changes and all right that has to be there uh, you should use type checking maybe something like typescript and all or flow uh so that you know if contracts are breaking because not everybody is like writing uh, uh, you know documentations all the time so here you need to adhere to contracts very well so yeah that is very important and yeah like i said parity might not be immediate 
So how about this? Basically, uh, there are many prerequisites to this. Definitely, you need to have a lot of consideration, effort into processes and adopting best practices, but definitely worth a try because of so many benefits it has. So yeah, I'll just summarize what we've discussed so far. We took three ways, right? Easy peasy way was just load your remote content into Electron, but it was destructive with superpower. Second one was you restrict node uh, access, enable context isolation, and it was performing. Uh, it was a uh, good, better than one, uh, maybe not better than uh, three, but definitely very easy to develop and uh, adopt, right, in an organization, right? So yeah, uh, that was good actually, uh, but there were performance quirks, right? There was maintainability issues with that and then bugs, right? The third one is local resources, right? Uh, so basically this is also good, but we've just discussed, right? Uh, you need to adopt a process with this and there is overhead, definitely. There is also another approach uh, that I have not mentioned here. It is basically sort of hybrid approach. You would want to mix and match second and three, uh, have some local resources and then uh, some of the hosted resources. And then you could access your remote uh, website and some part of the local resources that you would post somewhere. And then the, maybe that is that might be a little experimental. I haven't really thought about it. So yeah, that 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 might be an approach too. So yeah. Uh, so this is all that I wanted to discuss actually today. Uh, there's a lot of things that has come from uh, uh, in this talk from folks at Slack. They also follow a similar kind of approach for developing their uh, desktop application and internet for memes and photos as well. So uh, thanks guys. Uh, this is all I wanted to uh, speak about today. Uh, any questions are welcome now. Please go on. Yeah. Uh, hi Nitish. Uh, hi. Yeah, uh, that was a very uh, you know, interesting session. Uh, I had a question. Uh, so in the initial slides, it was mentioned about uh, the dedicated uh, windows, right? Uh, so what uh, I mean? Uh, can you explain a little bit on that? Uh, not exactly dedicated window. So basically, what is happening is, uh, if you see uh, uh, Electron, Electron has a main process, right? like your normal browser would have. And there are uh, other processes, uh, render process, right? And they're, they're process in itself, right? Like you would have tab. So there's something called multi-process architecture, which is like, there's one single process that is also running. And then there are multiple processes, like each tab is a process in Chrome. Similarly, Electron follows the same pattern implicitly. Uh, and uh, basically, whenever you try to create a browser window, right? It is basically like creating a render process. So you would have a render process for creating your splash screen maybe. And then what you would do is you'll uh, turn off that process, create a new render process and show your main application, right? Likewise. So as many uh, processes as you create, uh, that will take uh, an, a minimal amount of CPU to run, right? CPU and memory usage. So that is what I was talking about. Okay, thanks. Uh, my name is Vijay. Um, I would like to, uh, I mean, I have a few questions on third approach, that the local resource approach. Yeah. Um, let's say I'm building an, uh, you know, very high intensive, like a graphic intensive application, like a rendering a 3D content in a browser. Mm -hmm. So a few of the you know, high intensive, high intensive process, I would like to offload in Electron app. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I mean, a couple of questions. One is uh, when I'm going with this third approach, what would be the you know, rendering engine that Electron will use? Is it like a Chromium based or is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically Electron gives you a combined runtime of Chromium's render part. So if you break down the browser, right? Browsers on a very high level, it is a render plus the engine, right? The V8 engine usually, mm -hmm. right? In Chrome now, or uh, Gecko or right? something like that. And render is the browser's render part. So render allows you to render the visual part and okay. engine is for the things that go with the engine, right? Like node or uh, like same engine is used across browsers mm -hmm. and node, right? So yeah, uh, so yeah, you'll get a Chromium in, uh, render basically. Okay. And uh, the second thing is uh, uh, for these in a high intensive uh, visualized apps, do you recommend to, I mean, any other additional benefits that we, we get if you go with this third approach, local resource based approach? Uh, definitely um, because, uh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Yeah, please continue. So definitely, because uh, now you have your local resources, right? So yeah. what you're basically saying is you own the 
sort of browser right if you compare it to browser you're owning that browser you can customize it at your will right and you can uh, without any overhead you can just modify it to suit your purpose so rendering if you code it well you can uh, ensure that rendering is not hindered by any thread blocking processes right like ipc would do in the second way right ipcs are thread blocking so any if you can avoid all of those things you can run a long long computational process in a separate background thread uh which is provided by an editor process by default in such a multi process architecture you are good to go actually you can just secure your uh, render for just rendering one of the things right and to support oh, yeah. the offline capabilities uh, i mean uh, if you look into i mean uh, browser based apps it will it shares the memory of browser so whatever the limitations that you have on the browser you can only save that much of data and when it comes to uh, this electron based app is there i mean can we offload this file storage to local system definitely definitely yeah. you can uh, we use uh, sqlite to some extent because we did not have such a uh, deep uh, thing for, to go ahead with something uh, more uh, you know sophisticated so sqlite work well in our case and uh, you can definitely use file system also you can just write to file store it because you have full access to file system right okay. with both second and third approaches so definitely offline support can be and the cpu process can we like you know can we allocate let's say i want uh, my my app to use uh, more of more memory or more ram or more so that kind of stuff compared to browsers is any additional advantage that we can take it out of it uh that is handled by uh, electron itself you can of course use your own uh, you can customize the code right because it is open source you can customize that and uh, i did not clearly understand what do you mean by uh, uh, let's say uh especially you know, when you when you comes to browsers you, it the memory is limited to what the browser is allowed to use uh, i think i am asking too many questions maybe i will give chance to others sorry yeah sure uh, nitesh nitesh may I request something uh -huh. if you are there online for yeah. some more time okay no uh, the very purpose we chose zoom was quite interactive to have it but uh, since we are little over on time Uh, we are uh, uh -huh. 20 minutes little lagging behind people can point okay. it directly ask questions to you in chat window and maybe you can uh, resolve them you yeah 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 that's them. perfect yeah? okay sure okay. that way the next talk whatever is going on if people have questions very specific they can post it there otherwise they can directly chat with you and get answers is that fine sure sure yeah definitely okay. Uh, thank, thank you, you thank you so much nitesh thank you i appreciate it uh, guys please go ahead in the chat window you can select nitesh kumar and you can post your questions to him or if you feel that is of generic importance you can uh, keep it for everyone and then uh, continue the chat questions okay uh, then i will pass on to uh, pass on to patro uh, who is actually going to uh, give a brief in terms of the meet up as well as some information patro are you ready yeah so uh, am i audible janardan yes yes perfect perfect yeah yeah can you please share your screen because i have joined uh, sure yeah i'm so i am sharing now Hey, uh, uh, welcome all. Uh, I think this ideally has to happen as a first thing, but yeah, there were some technical difficulties. I could not be able to join. Uh, so, hey, Janardan, are you sharing screen uh, too? Yeah, I'm sharing. Yeah. I'm just starting now. One minute. Mm, you should be seeing it now. Yeah, I can. I am seeing it. You know, I am seeing it. Yes. Are you able to see now? Yes. Yes. Cool. Okay. okay so this is our uh, 41st uh, javascript meetup and it's online only uh, because of all the covid situations uh, so you can follow us on our twitter handle uh, it's js meetup uh, blr uh, uh, so you can find us over there and if you follow us you can get quick updates and our announcements over there uh, janardan next slide please yeah so if you uh, see uh, we are uh, Uh, who we are uh, so we are a community of uh, web developers passionate web developers javascript developers uh, we are close to 7000 members now uh, as of today and we have done uh, around 40 plus events and we have a pool of 100 plus speakers who have uh, given a talk at various uh, of our events so that's what uh, we are at high level uh, janardan uh, next slide please 
yeah so uh, why why javascript meetup like why we have to join meetup or why we are doing this meetup so if you uh, we you all aware of like web technologies and javascripts uh, keep evolving uh, so to keep pace with how the web technology and javascript evolving we have to keep learning and uh, only way we can learn uh, uh, is uh, aware of what's happening around us uh, in terms of uh, web technologies, in terms of JavaScript, in terms of JavaScript libraries, frameworks, everything. So we keep on seeing every day some new library comes up, some new framework comes up. And uh, ideally it's a trap because they say, I mean, you can build app in five minutes, 10 minutes, but or, but really if you see a production label app cannot be built in minutes, it needs a lot more effort and not a lot more nitty gritties to understand uh, to develop a production grade application. So that's what we, we will try to cover so every one who is having uh, those travel knowledge when i say like they learn from their team they learn inside their company maybe they're using some good libraries which we are not aware of so all this people can come and share so that uh, others can learn from that how it is happening in other companies how people are uh, leveraging the technology and the new libraries or the frameworks which is coming into in an actual production grade application and that's the whole intention of why we're doing meetup so that we can share uh, our learnings to others so that uh, everybody can uh, apply that in their uh, project and company and team and at the last we believe in connecting humans obviously we are uh, doing online meetup because of whole covid situations uh, but if you we always love uh, to do it uh, some of the companies so that we can meet people we can talk and uh, things like that so uh, Janardhan next slide please so what we can gain from it right so everybody can gain from it be it a beginner or intermediate label or expert label so these are the things which we thought uh, definitely will be benefit uh, being a part of this uh, large JavaScript community so beginners can get to know like where to start uh, if they want to be a, a JavaScript or a web developer they can view our webinars they can ask for a webinar if they feel uh, some places they want to learn uh, they can get a practical help day-to-day -day problem so we have a lot of channels our uh, slack channel is there whatsapp is there telegram is there so they can you can post your questions and there are our developers who can answer to that you can share your code for the review if you're working on some pit projects or some open source project then you can share that you can share your hobby project to get partners you can subscribe to job posting so a lot of time uh, we post job posting on our slack channels so you can you'll get notification to that you can reach to the wider audience for blogs so if you're writing any blogs and things like that you can obviously reach to a wider audience to get the reviews and feedbacks uh, you can share your libraries and code if you're building it uh, you can enhance your learning by helping others uh, so uh, you can get an adopters to your QC's idea. So there are a lot more. So this is like what we have highlighted high level, but you can leverage uh, this community to uh, extend what you can think of. So we have a lot of channels and you can think of what channel is right for you. So we have meetup.com where we regularly post what our next meetup will be. We connect over there. Uh, for our uh, technology talks or the meetups or some uh, technology sessions and things like that. Uh, so we have Slack, WhatsApp and Telegram where a day to day developer discussions can happen. You stuck somewhere, you can post your queries over there. We have a YouTube channel of people who prefer online content and being not in Bangalore, they could not able to join some of our events. This event is online. So it's, it's actually uh, reaching everybody who is outside of Bangalore as well. We have Twitter and LinkedIn also where we do an announcement and updates. So that's what our channels are. Uh, next slide, uh, another piece. So these are all again, same, uh, continuing the channel. So this all links are available in our uh, meetup.com uh, page. So you can go to that uh, you will get all the links, uh, whether you want to join to our Slack or a webinar or a JavaScript meetup, GitHub, things like that. Uh, another, next slide please. So if you see uh, all these communities runs by volunteers only. Uh, so we don't do any, uh, this is not a paid activity. Everything happens uh, with a volunteer activity only. And uh, so if you want to volunteer, all are welcome. Anybody can come and join as a volunteer so they can spread the word, they can attend talks, they can bring friends to meet up. You can share your blog, share your GitHub links, propose a talk, 
ask your company to host us maybe we can you can moderate our newsletters and things like that you can moderate some of our channels so if you see we have a lot like close to 7000 in our community but the volunteers are actually very less it's maybe 0.1 percent who is actually volunteering for this entire community so we also urge anyone who wants to volunteer please reach out to me or janardhan uh, we'll definitely see how you can contribute to the community uh, janardhan uh, next slide please uh, so we believe uh, we believe in willingness is greater than skill whether you have a skill or not but if you are willing to learn something willing to do something then you can make a change and that's what our belief is and that's how we are running uh, this community also uh, janardhan uh, okay, so this is an announcement. Uh, so uh, we are having this AWS summit online. Uh, it's on 13th May. You can register for this. So we are. Uh, so you can. You, all these details uh, will be posting to our Twitter channels and our Meetup page also. So you can get to know that. Uh, so any anybody who is interested to uh, learn on AWS, uh, they can join this link. Uh, it's an online event, and there are very really, really cool topics and content over there. Uh, so go and explore if if you are interested on AWS. Thank you. Uh, so I'll not take much time. And we have agenda. We have four talks today. One we have already done. So next uh, talk is uh, so okay. I, I forgot to mention uh, for this particular event we have our community partner as a Deep Source IO. Uh, so big uh, thank you uh, to Deep Source IO for uh, being a community partner for this event. Uh, so I think we have Aman uh, from Deep Source IO uh, who will do some announcement from Deep Source IO and as well as next talk uh, will be uh, by Aman on uh, uh, some on view.js. Aman, over to you. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. One second. Let me just share my screen. Uh, let me know if it's visible. Yes, it's visible. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, hi everyone, uh, and uh, thank you, uh, Patro and uh, uh, Chanadar for on, for having me and. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'll uh, make a little announcement. See, uh, uh, so hi guys, my name is Aman Sharma, and uh, I am a front-end developer at Deep Source. And uh, uh, the announcement basically is that uh, 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 we basic we currently are looking for a JavaScript engineer, basically a language engineer. And uh, the tool uh, Deep Source itself is a, a co static code analysis tool. So we have multiple uh, analyzers right now, like uh, Ruby, Python, Go, and uh, stuff like that. And uh, uh, JavaScript is in its uh, pretty early stage. So it is it has been made, and it's like uh, in a sort of in a beta phase right now. So, uh, but the thing is, uh, we need to we needed to improve so that uh, you know people could relate to uh, relate to the issues uh, which are created more and stuff like that. So. Uh, we want like we are looking for people who are you know interested in uh, honing on uh, uh, more on javascript and uh, uh, basically focusing on javascript itself and uh, what we are looking for simply is people who will be able to uh, maintain uh, the javascript analyzer uh, add new rules to it and uh, uh, basically decreasing all the false positives that uh, which gets raised or something and also we uh, currently uh, uh, we have launched for like past one or two months. We have launched this auto fix, uh, uh, auto fix feature, which it, which is basically a feature which allows us to, which allows you to uh, automatically fix the issues which are raised. Uh, it creates a PR and everything. So we are we also want uh, anybody who is interested. So we want you uh, you to uh, you know hone on that as well and uh, understand that as well. Uh, so this is uh, somewhat we are, uh, this is, these are the basically the characters the characteristics of uh, uh, somebody we are looking for and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, totally upon you you uh, if you are interested at all so you can reach out to me uh, my basically my uh, email address is aman at deepsource.io i'll type it in the chat as well 
and uh, also uh, on just a last note to this announcement is that uh, uh, we are a pretty uh, compact team right now 14 to 14, uh, 14 to 15 people uh, so uh, we are a compact team but uh, we uh, like uh, are working really hard even in uh, this uh, covid times we are working uh, really hard to make this product better and uh, we are backed by yc as well so uh, that uh, that has been like a blessing in disguise so uh, things like that has happened so yes uh, our culture right now uh, is pretty much uh, helping each uh, uh, team member that we are uh, so it's helping us to improve in several ways and uh, it has encouraged us to uh, reach out to uh, like reach out and join communities like uh, special communities like well javascript community um, so yeah that's pretty much it so you can reach out to me at aman at deepsource.io i'll write it in the chat also so yeah uh, uh, yeah so yeah, yeah i am starting okay yeah go on jamal aman yeah yeah once Yeah. So, uh, well, hello. I am Aman Sharma. I introduced myself before, <laughs> and uh, uh, so today in this talk, uh, uh, basically, I'll be talking about uh, rendering of lists uh, simply uh, using Vue.js. And uh, what do I mean by list over here? Uh, lists basically, uh, we almost see it every day. The lists. Uh, uh, on social media, especially in these COVID times, you might be seeing it a lot, and uh, you're, you're using Instagram and stuff like that. So the feeds that are coming simply are what an array or a list of, of some kind. So uh, uh, this is a pretty basic talk, but uh, uh, we will be covering the rendering part, uh, the basic part, and also some caveats as well uh, that may occur, and also. A very subtle bug that I faced once, so I find this interesting. So uh, I'll be sharing that as well in this talk. Yes. Yeah, so let's get started. Yeah. So the first is simply rendering an array. Uh, we'll be doing that using uh, Vue.js. So what uh, Vue.js has is uh, uh, Vue.js uh, has a V for directive, and it is pretty much like the for in loop uh, of JavaScript. And uh, so what we have in this case is uh, if we have an array named items and uh, uh, that is the source rate array and uh, uh, if we use v for in this way, in this manner, so we can write item in items with where item will be the alias for uh, uh, for array element for, uh, for that uh, for each particular array element. And what this v for will do, it will repeat uh, the li element uh, as many as times uh, as much uh, uh, items are there in the items array and it will uh, uh, print all of those things it will render all of this thing in the dom so as simple as that uh, and uh, just a simple example over here as well yeah so you can see this is the very basic code uh, as i showed items item and here is uh, the view instance. This is the items array and it is being printed over here. Uh, now this is one thing and uh, uh, another uh, um, a bit of an extension to this is that you can also use, uh, uh, you can also uh, get index uh, while iterating over the item. So, Simply, item is an uh, basically uh, is an index is at index index. So uh, item one is at index zero, two is at one, three is at two. So yeah, uh, this is a pretty basic uh, 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 rendering of uh, any list in uh, Vue.js. Uh, but uh, the next thing is uh, one second, one second. so next thing is uh, that. Uh, these things like uh, in Vue.js, pretty much everything is uh, reactive. So, well, this is also reactive. And when I say that, I, I don't mean that it's 100% reactive. It's not because it has its own caveats, which I will be discussing again. Uh, but uh, uh, let me show you a simple example uh, reactive in what manner. So, one second. So, this is a simple 
a Vue.js uh, list I have rendered. So each list, uh, basically each item is a, a, a tweet, a simple tweet. So uh, this is uh, basically three tweets are rendered over here. This is the data. I've created a component named tweet box and uh, basically this is a tweet box. And yeah, I've used that component over here. I use that component over here and I'm iterating over it v4 using v4 one tweet in tweets right so and I'm passing a tweet whatever is coming uh, as a single object I'm passing it into this tweet box as a property and uh, that property is basically received here and hence basically everything is rendered well anyways so yeah I was saying uh, so basically I have added two buttons over here which one will add a random tweet and one will uh, uh, basically pop the last tweet. So we have three tweets here. So when we click on add a tweet, uh, there's one random tweet added. So basically what is happening here is uh, whenever we click on this button, one new tweet, one new object gets pushed into this array. And uh, what Vue is doing is since this is reactive, so Vue is automatically showing it over here. And similarly, if I'm removing something, it is also being reflected directly over here. This is the reactive part. But uh, again, I'm saying it doesn't mean that it's always reactive. Uh, whenever I'm saying that I make a change somewhere in the array, that's true. Uh, in certain ways, if I make changes, it will stay reactive. But uh, in some way, it won't be uh, reactive anymore. And that we'll be discussing later on. Uh, apart from this, um, uh, this uh, apart from this uh, v4 directive can also be used with an object uh, we can iterate over uh, an object as well but only on the first level of it not to the very depth and uh, a very similar way in a very similar way uh, we have the object we will apply v4 value in object which is basically not the key but the value of each property of that object so we will be uh, we can iterate over that now uh, again, two examples I have for this because uh, similarly, uh, just like uh, before with arrays, you can iterate over here. This is the object. It has title, author, and published at. And uh, HTML is pretty simple, pretty basic. And uh, you can see that we have iterated over that and the value has been printed over here, right? So this, uh, this was the value of each, uh, each uh, property of this object. Uh, but now uh, there is again like uh, we had the index thing here we can get the key as well uh, value comma key in object and simply we can use it this way so this is a very basic implementation of uh, v4 by now now uh, yes uh, now we get yeah now we're going, going to get into some little tricky stuff so uh, maintaining state now uh, there's something known as key attribute uh, uh, which has to be used with uh, v4 and uh, we'll know uh, why is it so important to use that but first of all let me just clear something out so um, when uh, when i showed you the tweets basically the three tweets uh, so we need to uh, understand what is the applications, basically what data is uh, related to the application state and which data is related to the temporary DOM state. So in those cases, whatever was being rendered uh, in those uh, uh, places like this image, this everything, this uh, message and everything, these were being rendered directly from the data. And uh, these data, this is reactive, data, data is reactive. and. Uh, so this is actually the application state now the uh, enter your comment fields were empty so whatever i enter in them and i leave it that way it will stay in the temporary dom state you just keep that in mind you'll understand what i'm trying to say later on so we now know what uh, application state is and what a what a dom state is now what a view does now vue.js has a strategy uh, of updating list of elements like whenever there are a list of elements basically in uh, in this case if uh, there are uh, these three tweets itself so whenever there is a change in the order of these tweets whenever there is a change in the order of the 
list of elements what view does is is it follows the in place patch strategy now what exactly does it mean is that view will not pick up each html chunk and it will not uh, shift those chunks it will simply uh, uh, it will simply uh, change the data that has been rendered over there it won't change the html thing it won't change it won't take the html chunk and move it totally so it's like uh, it's basically uh, an effort to you know uh, uh, increase performance because uh, as lesser of the dom manipulation we do that is much better so uh, view tries to you know excel in that so this is an in place patch strategy again i'm saying uh, we won't uh, whenever there's a change in order of elements the data is only changed only the data at all each of those places is changed basically uh, whatever is in the data is directly reflected but not the html part is moved at all because uh, 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 logically if we see so the html part is same right each and every html part is anyway same so this is what normally happens the in place uh, it uses the in place patch strategy now what if we do it like this uh, in similar uh, similarly if there's a for example uh, this is uh, 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 basically these uh, these are uh, consider the, this block and uh, uh, yeah one second yeah consider this block and this block as two html uh, chunks so this is basically something that uh, this is x and uh, it uh, it is rendering data from uh, application state and it has some temporary dom state xyz and uh, 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 this is a, a chunk y which is also coming from application state and has abc as a temporary dom state now if we swap both of these if we swap x and y if we swap the order so what will happen is the order of the now according to view according to the in place patch strategy view will change the data that was rendered over here it won't pick up this whole block and shift it here it will only change the data thus what happens is it will change the data of x and y but x y z will remain the same because those were not related to data at all those were temporary dom states those were not related to the application state at all so uh now this is a problematic state now uh, this do doesn't usually come up as a problem uh, but uh, still it's a problematic thing and uh, let me show you in practical uh, how uh, what do i mean by things okay so uh yeah so it's uh, the words are visible right hello yes sir visible okay. yes yeah yeah okay so yeah so so it's the same example again the tweets sim, uh, different tweets example so or now just uh, i have a new button over here which is the shuffle button and uh, uh, all it will do is basically shuffle uh, randomly shuffle everything so now what i'm going to show is i'll write something over here i'll write this and uh, this is a comment commented by thanos for example and uh, uh, i've just written it over here and uh, there's nothing to it it's just uh, uh, entered into the temporary dom state now when i shuffle you see this thanos comments doesn't move at all why because it belong to the html uh, it belong to the uh, dom state temporary dom state and what view does is it just changes the data it just changes the data over here it doesn't move the html at all so this may seem like a very um, not a huge problem right now but uh, uh, it when it, when things get complex it uh, uh, creates a lot of problems and uh, not only in the case of temporary data uh, as i sh just uh, showed you that uh, this is a tweet box this is a component that i have created this one single component i have created uh and i'm use i'm basically iterating uh, this uh, several times this component on this component so uh, not only if uh, i have written something in the uh, temporary dom state if this was to be another child component and uh, whatever i have entered is uh, basically uh, stored in the child component and uh, uh, and it is uh, uh, reciprocated over here 
then the similar thing would have happened uh, if uh, anything is happening basically what is happening is uh, uh, i have three components and each component has its own child component so uh, whenever there's a change view doesn't know where, where to keep this so it just keeps it uh, where, wherever it was so it may happen when the temp whenever there's something in the temporary dom state or uh, the data is dependent on the child uh, component state uh, and we change the order and things get uh, like this so what is the solution to this what is the solution to this is uh, now the solution over here is to use the keys attribute and the keys attribute is as simple as as i as i told you that this was a uh, one single chunk right so what was the problem last time when i swapped these two chunks so this abc was in the uh, this abc and xyz was in the dom state of x and y uh, respectively but they uh, they didn't change at all their order as if they didn't even belong to uh, x and y basically so now when i'm using the keys attribute what keys attribute allows me to do is it just allows me to add a unique id to those things so uh, this for example this uh, uh, html chunk now has an id id equals to 1 now and this other chunk has an id id equals to 2 now if i swap x and y it is not only x and y which is being swapped it's the 1 and 2 which is being swapped so entirely abc and y will be swapped so this solution is the only solution in this case so uh, again this example the same example but over here what we have done is we have used key attribute and this key attribute we are assigning simply the tweet dot tweet id each id is unique one two three and now let's do the same thing uh, yeah and let's see if it works see it works it is moving with the uh, uh, whenever this uh, th uh, thanos uh, uh, data moves it moves with that because now this is associated with uh, this uh, chunk as a whole this uh, dom state so this way uh, uh, so this way maintaining state happens in uh, uh, in in view js and uh, uh, and uh, i actually have to show you another example so this happened to me uh, uh, this is uh, this example that i just showed you is pretty simple but uh, uh, there was this uh, feature that i was implementing in deep source deep source so uh, the feature was pretty simple ki okay, aman sorry to uh, interrupt you uh, it's a time mm -hmm. check so yeah. maybe sure sure okay okay 5 yeah. minutes more to yeah sure sure mm -hmm, sorry sure, for sure. it we are running little late <laughs> yeah not a problem not a problem sure so uh, just uh, one in in a short while i'll i'll explain everything so uh, so the problem was uh, what happens when somebody logs on uh, to deep source and they just uh, are onboarded what they have to do is they have to select their analyzers and everything and they uh, a toml is generated and everything so the toml is generated in real time when i was implementing this so something something freaky happened see this i have recreated the bug over here whenever i type something it is printed over here that's cool it comes under the go uh, section uh, but when i delete it okay the go section is gone but when i type something over here this state is persisting this thing is persisting and it it was just killing me because i didn't know the solution at that time uh, so it took me more than half a day uh, so this thing was simply uh, what was happening over here is these three are uh, separate view components and uh, uh, these three are view components and its data uh, basically uh, uh, these are the child of a, a whole single component of this and this uh, uh, data whichever uh, is going in in those in this uh, child component it is returning a certain data back to be represented in the toml json so uh, whenever i uh, stored something over here it was stored uh, and uh, it was stored in the uh, uh, state of uh, each and every uh, component and that same situation created was created again so in the end uh, uh, the solution was to uh, you know uh, just apply the uh, the keys attribute now the next thing is uh, array change detection uh, basically uh, uh, what view 
can do is uh, the detection of changes in array uh, uh, mutation methods uh, all the mutation methods you know the mutation methods like uh, which uh, the methods which uh, uh, allow us to change make a change into the array into the existing array so these are simply uh, th those methods and uh, the uh, changes done by this is simply uh, reacted are reactive so these are uh, uh, changes are rec uh, recognized uh, replacing an array so basically these kind of methods like filter concat and slice so these methods uh, return its uh, own array right so if uh, for example that list of tweets if you want to filter out the list of tweets on the basis of something so we'll use this filter uh, and we'll replace the original data with uh, whatever it's returning so what uh, view does fantastically over here is uh, it doesn't again allow to uh, you know create new uh, the whole new uh, HTML lists. It doesn't allow uh, uh, to create new uh, HTML chunks. It tries its best to reuse almost all of it because most of the data is overlapping. So this is one thing that happens. Next are the the uh, this is last and uh, next are the caveats in change detection. Uh, whenever there's a uh, so when things are changing, uh, there are some cases in in which changes are not detected. So first case is this. If I have data and uh, VM, if uh, this is basically VM, uh, so if I'm changing something in A, I'm changing the value that will be reactive, that will be shown. But if I'm changing some, but if I'm adding a new property, then it will not be reactive. So uh, what we we basically use in this case is view dot set, and uh, set, view dot set is like uh, one of those answers wherever there is not a reactivity occurring, we can make it occur by using view dot set because it allows us to add a reactive property to any object so a simple example to that is uh, this uh, this is i'm showing you directly the solution uh, normally this property because i'm using view dot set over here to add a new property into this prop one dot uh, yeah into this object uh, and apart from this for uh, I've explained about objects and the another caveat are in the arrays and that is uh, if we are uh, there are two caveats here and uh, one is uh, if we are uh, uh, simply directly changing something at an index basically at index 0 1 or somewhere we're directly changing something it won't be reactive and the other one is if you are trying to change the length of the array uh, directly like this it won't be reactive so again, the solution for both of these is one is view dot set again, as I said before, this reactive thing can be solved easily by that. And the other is uh, we can use uh, items dot splice method. So splice method, as I told you, uh, the uh, replacing an array uh, part, it, uh, basically these kinds of uh, functions are, uh, can be easily uh, traced by view. So, uh, uh, so yeah, uh, again, I, I'll directly show you the solution. So yeah, so change value at two, uh, index two. So it, the value gets changed. If I reduce array to array length to two, the value gets changed. If this was, uh, I, since I have used over here items.splice and view.set as I explained, uh, since I've used this, it has worked. Otherwise it wouldn't have worked. So this was uh, pretty much the overview of uh, list rendering uh, and uh, yeah, if you are curious more about to, to learn more about uh, how reactivity is working over here and what view.set is and everything, so you can dig more deeper into uh, the Vue.js documentation simply. Uh, uh, Vue.js, you can search Vue.js list rendering. Yeah. So thank awesome. you and any questions? Hey, uh, just before the question, so um, next session, next topic will start in five minutes. So sure. if you have any questions, uh, or this topic or previous topic, we can use this five minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. Or if you want to take a break in that also, you can take a break in yeah. that five minutes. So next session will just start in five minutes. And next session will be by Bharat. It's about mm -hmm. open source pass uh, using Node.js, uh, how he have built the mothership. So that yeah. will be our next topic uh, from yeah. Bharat yeah. Agrawal, just yeah. after five minutes. Yep. So Aman, uh, you can use this five minutes if anyone has any question yeah anyone has any questions that's fine uh, i can aman uh, this is manoja yeah yeah hi manoj okay aman i'm very sorry i had a different session i just logged in for this session now 
i'm extremely sorry <laughs> but uh, aman uh, i am from a finance background but currently uh-huh. i'm interested in the technology yeah so uh, i'm very much interested in using the public apis uh-huh. so if i if i need to use the apis like linkedin's api or google's api uh-huh. how much of the html css and javascript i should be aware of uh, actually not mostly i think you should be aware of javascript and uh, html and css would just uh, it's uh, you just need to get the data from the api right so uh, for that uh, you need to be more aware of the javascript part so html css i don't think is it's okay yeah the basic knowledge you not css i don't think so if you if you are just experiment with the ex- experimenting with the api so you don't even need css you just need to uh, get the data and you just need to display it on your screen so html is fine for that aman bhai see i have started learning python Mm-hmm. So, for my pur- a purpose of using uh, the API, is there a requirement of Python with JavaScript, or just J- JavaScript is enough? No, I don't think so. That uh, you'll be needing Python because uh, you already have an API which is served somewhere, and you just need to uh, get data from that API on your client side. So, on your client side, JavaScript is the only thing that you can do. Uh, Aman, by is there any video in YouTube or something you can recommend? I mean, which helps in the initial stage? I say, which? I think, I think, which goes in Udemy. uh yeah so yeah there are a lot of courses uh i can probably uh, share it in the uh, chat once we are done with the questions will that be fine yes bhai yes 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 okay thank you bhai hmm. any other question um, yeah if others doesn't have any questions i would like to ask one question yeah, yeah. Um, one thing is um, it's too generic not sure whether it's appropriate question as well Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, uh, nowadays you see a lot of uh, frameworks coming out, uh, mm-hmm. and the quite popular uh, Angular, React, and then Vue. Vue. Yeah. So mm-hmm. when it comes to rendering part, I hear that you know Vue has got its own advantages compared to other frameworks. Do you have any insights on? Uh, can you maybe just a brief comparison on what way it is different? Uh, so not sure whether it's the right question, but uh, yeah. yeah. Question. No, no. Actually, it's a it's a good question because. Uh, i was about to start the talk with by saying that i'll be talking about view the framework that pissed a lot of react js users so uh, well anyways so yeah so the rendering part right so again if you have used the uh, react.js uh, so it uses it has its own render function and uh, whatever the code is written the html code it's in jsx so view also does that it just has a its own layer over it it's nothing uh, like much more and that's why we call view as a framework and react as a library so yeah there's like uh, in in case of rendering over here in view uh, all we we need to do is just uh, define a view instance as i showed you over here uh, and uh, you know assign the el uh, tag to basically something so that's as simple as that in view uh, but i know in react uh, guys have to use the render function and everything I'm not a React guy. I'm a loyal uh, supporter of Angular. I've been through Angular one and then in Angular X now. Okay. So, but uh, yeah, I would like to. Um, I hear the quite a lot of what is used. Yes. So, uh-huh. so more curious on what way it is different. Yes. So to- yeah, there there are a lot of things actually, but uh, uh, the most basic thing uh, is like uh, so. My comparison is always. Uh, i have not used react a lot but uh, the little bit of comparison that i have is with react because i have used it a little bit so yeah. what i saw was like uh, basically the separation of concerns what uh, there there was separation of concerns in react as well but uh, 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 separations of concerns of uh, basically uh, uh, the template part and uh, the javascript part and things like uh, uh, in in react js it was more like what it's again my perspective it was more like the state and the um uh the javascript is uh, uh, uh separated uh, is uh, decoupled but uh, in Rea- in vue js basically the html part the template part and uh, and the whole javascript part is very much decoupled so it feels like uh, you are writing uh, uh, html basically and you are uh, using uh, some uh, javascript basically vue over that but in react it's uh, a little different like you are using uh, 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 javascript and uh, you are uh, creating templates through javascript basically okay uh, aman uh, aman one last question how, how should i understand uh, what is the framework uh, 
a framework a library module on function i mean how should i understand this so uh, so library module so so basically the, the it's a it's a question like it's a very famous interview question <laughs> but uh, uh, this uh, framework and library difference what i know i'm just sharing that i'm not really uh, strong on that uh, but i'm what i'm sharing is uh, whenever there is a library basically it's a, uh, it is a fundamental basically a unit it's uh, it's uh, directly built over the core language a library and uh, the framework is built over uh, on the basically the layer of the library uh, using that basically library so that's why vuejs is a framework and react is a library so that's just my perspective it there can be many answers to the question hey, so sorry to interrupt uh, aman you can still be online uh, people yeah, yeah, uh, all can ask question to nitesh he can chat yeah. on so uh, mm -hmm. we'll be moving to our next session sure, sure, uh, with sure. to bharat over to you thank uh -huh. you aman thank you thank you very much thank you for having me uh, thanks thanks patro um, thanks patro and jonathan for organizing the session uh, i hope some of you got to take a break um, because i know this can get overwhelming so much information um, so a little bit about myself i am a software engineer at atlassian i just joined them last month uh, mothership is an open source project i i built a remote team of three people and um usually infrastructure projects don't use javascript they kind of dismiss javascript as a as a insignificant language one might say so you know people say we use go or python but what i have found is that uh, the node ecosystem is really rich and i wanted to share how my team built a platform as a service using uh, using just javascript and the node ecosystem so i'll just uh, present about that in terms of questions i you can post them in chat and i'll take them at the end because uh, i don't want to uh, interrupt my my flow so i'll share my screen yeah just a sec <clears throat> yeah so uh yeah so mothership is as i mentioned an open source platform as a service um I, before anything else, I, I want to just uh, give a small demo of what it looks like to deploy an application. Um, may, maybe some of you have had this experience at work where you wasted a lot of time deploying an application. You want to spend your time writing, writing instead of deploying. So this is what it would look like. Um, so uh, we, this is a demo of the web interface. So you might want to give an application a name. Uh, in this case, it's a ticketing app. um and then you have two options you could, you could uh, deploy using a web interface or a command line interface and there's also a help check help check at the top that you can use oops sorry um i'm demoing using a video because things always go wrong when you do it like uh, so uh, you supply a zip file to the to the inter interface the, the zip file will contain your code in, in this case it's a uh, a rails application that that we're providing and uh, the build process complete so you can you can see how that's happening on the web interface uh, then this particular application has a postgres database so you can uh, add a database with a click of a button and um, also with rails applications you need to set some environment variables this also you can do using the web interface so you just mention a couple of things like what is the rack environment and there's also a setting for um for static files that that one would do using this um that also you can add to the web interface so once you've done all of this uh, typically an application will have a database that you would want to migrate uh, there are some migrations that might be there in your uh, source code so you can run that using a console um and you just type a rails db migrate or i rake db migrate in the case of a rails app this uh, this is an example of a rails app i know this is a node meetup but like i primarily come from a ruby background so excuse the use of an external sort of framework so now that uh, that's done you have an app that's deployed you can see the health healthy status and uh, you can see that there's a there's a um what do you call this a live uh, url 
with the name ticketing.mothership.live and if you want to you can register register yourself and basically this is the app being used the app is functional um so as opposed to uh, so I, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, what deployment options are out there and, and why mothership would make sense for somebody um so there is a bare metal which is like the old school way of doing things you get your own physical machine you take care of of electricity you take care of overheating components you take care of everything um and that's not the most practical thing for a developer if you have a small thing that you want to deploy you don't want to spend your energies on that so there was an abstraction built on top of that which is known as the iaas provider which is the infrastructure as a service provider examples of these would be digitalocean or aws uh, what these guys do is they take a bare metal a physical machine they chop it up into parts and expose you expose a virtual private server to you so you don't have to take care of electricity and stuff like that now you have to take care of the operating system the dependencies um and um language on time stuff like that um so again that might be too much for somebody who's focus is purely on writing application code that's where a platform as a service comes in an example of that would be heroku um that uh, you just your only th- concern is um is uh, one second your only concern is um supplying the application code and and the the pass takes care of everything for you this is where mothership stands uh, but in a traditional pass uh, what happens is that you provide the uh, the code but the third parties uh, are in charge of the costs that you're dealing with so heroku will have its own charge heroku is typically deployed on top of an ias provider uh, i so like heroku typically uses aws um what we want with a self hosted pass is that you get you gain more control uh, you gain more control in terms of pricing in terms of uh, privacy of your data so the only third party that you are reliant on is the uh ias provider that you are hosting your pass on which would be as i said before aws for digital ocean or linode or any other provider so uh what are the benefits of going open source uh one as i mentioned is control uh as your tra- traffic increases the prices go exponential rather than linear with the with the with the third party like pass with the third party pass um provide agnostic if you want to switch between aws or digital ocean it's much easier um trust uh maybe this amazon is a is a competitor of yours or maybe heroku is a competitor of yours heroku is owned by salesforce so you'd want to uh keep more keep more of your uh of your data and code in control and of course because open source you you can audit what's going on you can fork it according to your needs or if you see some problem with the pass you can patch it yourself um so uh our goals for deploying applications on mothership which we haven't seen on any, any other open source uh, platform is uh that a person should not need to to know uh one second a person should not need to know anything about uh, containers or servers uh can you guys see my chat screen i'm trying to shut it down um yeah just yeah uh yeah so you do not need to know uh anything about how servers work or containers work you only provide application knowledge and also uh, we wanted to support multiple languages out of the box uh with minimal configuration at least um and there are two aspects to this one is deploying your applications and then since this is a self hosted open source thing you we want to make it easy to set up the mothership itself um so it should be easy to get it up and running and it should be easy to scale your mothership up and down as as your needs change over time um so this is how you would set up mothership typically you type in mothership setup and uh you have to enter some sort of token to a third party provider here we use digital ocean by default then you enter the domain that you want to host your mothership at and then mothership start takes care of everything else so in terms of provisioning a server setting up a distributed system of uh, of nodes and even uh, starting up the the application within the node uh, all of that is done for you uh, so all you have to do is take in these ip addresses and change the dns settings for your domain 
So this is a one-time process. Once you do this, you have your own platform as a service. Um, yeah, so uh, I hope I'm not going too fast. It's just I have to cover quite a lot. Uh, so um, I'll try and um, I'll try and not uh, skim over things. So uh, a, a pass typically has to solve four problems uh, the way my team saw it. One is a tenancy, which is uh, where does where do your applications live? Uh, whether it, it is you have multiple applications on one server or you have one dedicated server per application, then it is packaging where you have to you have to have an environment where the application can run, where everything that it needs is provided for. Uh, then there is resource scheduling, which is like uh, you have these resources, but like where do you place them? Um, and this is especially relevant to your needs in terms of how much infrastructure you need. And service discovery, which is like fine, you have everything organized, but you have to ex expose that to, to outside people. Um, so uh, single tenancy is useful if you have very heavy duty apps and you want a dedicated server, but we are thinking, we have designed for small applications. Um, a ticketing app does not necessarily need a one GB, 25, uh, like one GB RAM and I don't know, 20 GB hard disk space. That's, how, that's what a, a typical small droplet or AWS server looks like. So we thought that multi-tenant app, multi-tenancy makes more sense. Um, so what I showed you was the, the web browser and the web browser is, is what's interacting with mission control. We deployed mission control using Mothership setup and that will have another server that hosts multiple applications. So in terms of, if we get down to the, the you know, if we start naming things, you, your, the application that we saw was an express application, express chess app on a remote machine. Um, so I'll slowly expose different parts of my infrastructure to you. Uh, so, uh, and I'll also talk about what open source projects were used along the way in order to, to get to this infrastructure. Um, so how do we create isolated environments where applications can run? So this calls for containers because uh, it's risky for uh, uh, multiple applications to be sharing the same file system. So you, you need them to be isolated uh, it, because if one application is compromised, then the entire server gets compl compromised. So here containers came into the picture for us. Um, what happens inside containers is that uh, they appear to have their own operating system, but actually they're very lightweight and they're using, essentially using Linux tricks to appear like they're, they're their own OS. They typically expose a port uh, to the outside world and that way they maintain some isolation. Um, so Docker actually made a lot of sense for us because we wanted to be able to serve multiple servers. And uh, how Docker typically works is that there's a Docker daemon, uh, daemon that runs in the background. And uh, I don't know if you guys have ever used the Docker CLI, uh, but that is essentially making API calls, REST API calls to the Docker daemon. And we can also make these REST API calls using uh, two remote machines. So we, we can have one mission control that can make uh, Docker API calls to um, multiple servers. So in this case, like, uh, ExpressJS, you mentioned before, uh, that we deployed ExpressJS app. Uh, since we're using Docker uh, remote on the, uh, the server that's been, that's controlling everything, we do that using Docker machine. Uh, so there's a Docker machine NPM library that we use to uh, provision the server and then once that server is set up, we use this library called Docker Road that uh, is essentially Docker plus Node. Uh, that library is used for making doc Docker API calls. So I'll just go to my web browser for a second and show these things out to you. Yeah. Um, so do Docker machine is uh, essentially Docker's way of just helping to you provision a, uh, uh, like a digital ocean droplet or AWS instance uh, with, with Docker and everything installed in it. Uh, and then on, along with Docker machine, I use this, we use the thing called, uh, so for this we used uh, this library called Docker node, 
Docker machine. Um, and what this does is that you can essentially initiate a Docker machine using it. Uh, then there is uh, Docker road, which is what is used by the machine control, uh, which is the application, the, the express app I was telling you about, that uses Docker road to issue commands to the applications in its form where you're hosting app, hosting, uh, my bad. Um, I'll just go back to the, yeah, so uh, machine control, this is an XSCS app and this needs to have a Docker client installed so that it can talk to multiple servers and uh, manage applications there. So, um, so do you can use Docker Road pretty much uh, for doing all of the things that you can do using the command line. Um, and wh what it does is a, a typical Docker uh, API engine call is like, let's say you want to create a container. Uh, you have to make this very complex call which has all of these parameters and this is essentially not designed to be done by humans. This is like machine machine API interaction. So what Docker Root does is that it it sets sets up good uh, defaults so that we can start doing what's necessary. And we also had to do a little bit of uh, playing around with what values go into the the post the body of the post post call. So it's, it's a post API call post slash container slash create. Um, so that's what we use the Docker road library for. Um, okay. I'll go back to this. I'm, uh, I have half an hour. So I'm, so I'm really sorry if I'm, if you guys are feeling like I'm rushing. Um, and I, I'm happy to kind of, uh, answer questions extensively later. Um, so now we've talked about going in a multi-tenant direction and we talked about isolation, but uh, we need to provide the isolated setting with the requirements that are there for, for applications to run. So, it, so there are stuff like system level dependencies. You need application runtime, language level dependencies. You have, um, you know, you have, uh, like various, uh, packages that you need for application to run. And also this is another thing is that you need to find out how to actually start the application. Uh, so in no, the node ecosystem, typically package or JSON, uh, we specify what uh, NPM start is, uh, or what command that should run. So, um, this, this is somewhat like that. So we, uh, started with creating custom Docker files for each of these. And that was a little cumbersome because we ha would have to create for each kind of, uh, application that's out there. And we were not really sure. We were kind of guessing what the start command was. Um, so this was uh, making our install processes pretty brittle. Uh, then we found out about build packs. Uh, build packs are standardized instructions for creating app environments. It's essentially three parts. The first part is detection. You detect what kind of application it is. The second part is provision of uh, dependencies. And the third part is de uh, detecting the start command. If the start command is not there, then it tries a sensible default. And if that doesn't work, then it hopes that you, you can provide one via a file called proc file. This is a, stand, a standard kind of file that's become uh, common in the open source space. Um, so we use build packs to uh, run against your code and find and prepare the environment. Uh, so if you go on GitHub, you'll find, um, you'll find various, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, you'll find various, um, build packs out there. So it's not just JavaScript group in Python. You'll find it for Go, you find it for static websites. And this is a community effort. If you want to contribute for more build packs, you can even contribute yourself. Um, so we take the Docker container, run it against a build pack and um, create a container which has all the requirements ready. So we use a library called Heroku-ish for this, um, which does, which automates this process for us, where it runs the, the code against the build pack and prepares the container. So I'll just show that to you. Uh, so 
yeah, all of the tools that we're using, by the way, are, are, are open source. So um, this is a Heroku build pack for Node.js applications. And um, this is the utility we use for, pre for preparing the containers, which is called Heroku-ish. Right, okay. Um, so resource scheduling. So uh, right now we have multiple, we have one server that runs multiple apps, but what if you need to run a crazy number of apps? Like what if your company has huge deals? Um, that then implies that we need to have multiple servers uh, that host our applications. Um, so then we're talking about uh, have interacting with Docker daemons on multiple servers. So again, these servers are also provisioned using Docker machine that I, as I talked about earlier. Uh, now the thing is you can have multiple servers, but like it's beyond a point, it's hard to keep track about what containers are running where. Uh, we need to think about what is the best place to put a new container and uh, what happens, how, what happens if a server if we pull down a server, how do we re redistribute everything? Um, this is something that has to be automated. So we found, we had to use this thing called a container orchestrator. Uh, there are two common uh, orchestrators out there, uh, Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. We chose to go with Docker Swarm uh, because that's the simplest in terms of uh, expanding your knowledge from Docker to Docker Swarm and also uh, our, our use case didn't need something as complex as Kubernetes. So um, a orchestrator will, will manage across multiple nodes. Um, it, 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 when you want to uh, create, update, or delete containers on a cluster, you go through the orchestrator and it manages everything for you. Uh, it, it does some basic management tasks like restarting if, if an application crashes. And uh, as I mentioned before, it redistributes when nodes are added or deleted. Hey, Bharat, yeah. uh, sorry to sorry to interrupt. Uh, it's a quick time check, so maybe uh, five minutes uh, more. Uh, sorry for it. We're running late. Sure, sure, no issue. Uh, cool. So, uh, uh, Bharat, just one more point from an audience point of view. This we have focused uh, JavaScript mostly on the frameworks and other stuff. So this looks a little bit on the infrastructure decision making under those. So this is not pretty much in line as much with the regular uh, talks. So please have questions probably offline if you don't mind. Uh, okay, so I do have some JavaScript stuff as well. Uh, I'll get to that. Sure, um, sure. yeah, that would help. Yeah. But all of this is uh, like, all of these are mostly node frameworks that I'm talking about. Um, so, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll skip ahead a little bit because I've only got five minutes left, but uh, broadly speaking, we uh, doc road allowed us to um, to put up, put our nodes in, in a swarm mode. So it, it act, docker road gives us the opportunity to orchestrate our nodes. Uh, I'll skip through this part in the interest of uh, talking about the JavaScript related things. So, okay. We have this distributed system of managing applications and we are preparing containers, we have isolation, we have all of that. But at the end of the day, that is not all the PaaS has to do. Users need to observe what are happening with their application. So um, one thing is a health check. A health check, what a health check does is that uh, it just pings the server every minute and if, uh, sorry, every second. And, and the health check decides that if a, uh, app is in a down status more than five times in a minute, then we say that an app is un unhealthy. Then there's this other aspect of build logs. So when you're deploying an application, you want to um, show what what is going on in terms of uh, getting built so that you can find out if there are any errors. Um, so, you know, we, we use uh, node streams for this. Um, there is this concept of service sent event endpoints, uh, which can be used to broadcast a stream uh, and then various uh, parties can subscribe to them. So our, our terminal emulator or our web interface can 
use HTTPS to subscribe to these endpoints. Uh, these endpoints, by the way, are sent. Uh, so the build stream is sent by the orchestrator to the mission control express application and the express application then sends out this information via a service sent event. Uh, then there are service logs, which is uh, what you, when you are running an application, what are the, the logs that are being generated? Um, so that we are using a WebSocket for sending across. Uh, so the, again, the orchestrator sends a stream of, uh, of the logs and then we have a duplex stream that uh, we sent by a web socket to uh, to the web interface or the, or the terminal. Um, then there is uh, running a terminal command. Um, so for this, we we create a ephemeral container so that our applications do not uh, change states. We have if we have multiple applications of a state, uh, mul multiple instances of an application, we don't want them to have different state. Um, so this is a two-way interaction, right? The terminal you want to write ls or you want to see what processes are running. So again, there's a duplex node.js stream that is broadcast over, over web sockets. Uh, then there is a, a database backup. So for, for database backup, if you run a backup command, typically, um, what you see, what we saw was that uh, the, all of the steps needed to get to that state is streamed on your terminal. So what we did was that we took that information uh, and we streamed that into a file, and that was a file that we exposed to the client. Uh, yeah. So in terms of uh, future work, that there, there are some things to be done. But actually, um, I think I'll I'll just uh, talk about my teammates and then field questions. So my other two teammates were in, uh, in the US. I was uh, here in Bangalore and we were building this. So in fact, we did all of this remotely, um, which is, so in some ways, this whole Slack and Zoom life is, is not new to me. Unfortunately, I was looking forward to <laughs> meeting you guys. Um, if you want to read the case study, we've uh, detailed, ex explained in detail all of the things I covered. Uh, you can go to mothership.live and uh, you can check out the source code on GitHub. Uh, you can check out my personal website on bharatagavar.io. And um, how much time do we have for questions? So, Bharat, what we'll do in the interest of time, you be online if people uh, can ask question on chat, and then you can answer. And maybe at the end, uh, if people still have more question, uh, we'll give you time for it. Right? Is that okay? Okay, okay cool. Um, hey, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say that I know that most of you guys are probably working on the front end side, but like what I wanted to say was that the Node ecosystem is really rich and uh, you can even do infrastructure work using JavaScript. I think that's one thing I want to demonstrate to you guys. Yep. Thank you, Bharat. It was really a very insightful talk. Uh, so, Sunny, are you ready? Uh, over to you. So, Sunny okay. will be our next speaker, and that's our last talk of the day. Thanks, Petro. Uh, yes, Sunny. Sorry, it's got a little late. Uh, because of other, yeah, over to you. Thank you so much. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Sunny. Um, like I'm front end engineer. I'm almost having like four point four plus years experience in front end. Currently working in uh, Google. And so today's talk is like basically uh, I'm going to share few things. Uh, not on any framework, not on any library, and not on any technology. Basically, I'm going to show only on the JavaScript and CSS part. So let's start directly with the concept, like what I'm going to explain today. So basically this is like, uh, whenever, if you're fresher, if you're experienced, you, whenever you go for interview, right, you told like then like, you know, HTML, CSS and JavaScript. So they ask few questions to you, like uh, what is uh, closures? What is hosting? Why they're asking? Because these are the common things. These are the basic things which you should know. But there were so many things uh, related to performance, related to, to hidden things, which people are not aware. So I have collected few questions, like few quizzes, basically a 10 quizzes, which like, which give you a better idea, like uh, what thing, like uh, it will give, give you the better idea by solving these quizzes. So like in today's session, I'm going to explain on some topics like about the paragraph elements, unused CSS. So I'll directly switch to one of the quiz. So this is a very basic quiz. So 
you have seen right uh, there is a day this is html css is a very basic thing so what you can do I, as soon as i ask some quizzes right you have to just type the uh, uh, correct options according to you in the chat so i'm seeing the correct option as well so let's try let's try with this quiz so for example the, we have a div which is having an inline css of color red then we have a child element tree which is having a color blue so according to you what will be the color of this hello world text so i'm i'm also going to run this like so you can see see, see it again uh, let me paste it here so according to you like what will be the like color of the text hello world so if you see right child the parent of this div right it is like a p tag which is like color blue so usually people will say like it's color blue so let's run let's run this and let's check what will be the answer so so why it is coming red so if you see right we have we have seen so many places like we should not use a block level element in the side the p p block so if you inspect the code right it will it will show you what will happen if you see in the ui i have included this div tag inside p block not not inside the parent div so what happens when the render tree if you are aware of the dom tree right so what happens is the p block throughout the child if it is a block level element outside the p if you see it removes it throughout the div tag outside that's why it is taking the red color so most of them like people are assuming it it is like blue color because it is in the child of p but it is coming as a red because it, when the dom construction is happening it is throwing out from the p tag so it is it is taking the it is taking the color of the parent tag which is right now which is right now div the parent div which is color red so these are the tricks i am going to share today like it's almost like 10 quizzes i am having so if maybe some of you know you know the answers but i have seen so so many places like uh, people are not aware with these concepts so my second quiz like a uh, second quiz is is having a very simple thing so so for example when we include any images in the css or when we include any image in the applications right we have so many approaches like background images then background then we have image tag so the question is so suppose in this case let me run this let me run this for better idea so for example if i run this code if i run this code so what what i have done i have created one image class which is giving the height and width that's it then there is a useless class which is having a background image and i have included in the ui so let's see how it is coming in the ui if you if you see right a normal it's a normal a basic basic code nothing high fi nothing extraordinary thing so the question is for example if you remove the useless class from the ui right so in the ui it will not come so that is fine but the question is the browser will load this image in the browser or not this is a very popular interview question if you go for any product based or if any startup they they expect the performance thing we know the small small things are there but they expect if any unused class is there and it is calling the background image what will happen in the browser so let me revert back and show you the network call so if you see right now if i refresh it right index.html it loads then it is like they loaded the pic.jpg file so they loaded the image in the browser so for the question is if i remove this useless class what will happen so what will happen so the question is like it will load the image in the browser or not so you can you can post you can post the options in the chat so it, a for yes or b for no so according to you what will happen it it should load or it should not so let's see what is happening so for example let's see the coverage how browser is how browser is like analyzing the things so there is a command to see the coverage command shift p, command shift p for mac or control shift p for windows if you see the coverage right just refresh it you see right there is a index.html there is a red portion and there is a blue portion it it is showing these lines are not covered it means useless class is loaded in the browser the class is loaded in the browser but no one has used it because no where they have in the dom tree useless class is not mapped with any of the node so in this case what is happening in this case if you see the network call right it is not loading because browser knows which class is loaded in the dom or not so in this case the question is image is loaded in the browser or not it means like the image is not loaded in this scenario 
let's take an another scenario so what will happen if i use display none so in this case what will happen it will load the image or it will not load the image in the browser the same question sunny you can check the comments window where yeah, people yeah. are answering yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. okay there is a lot of active participation here <laughs> yeah i am seeing it so yeah. so let's see the next question so according to you what will happen uh, so if i use the useless image and if i added the display none it will load the images or not so for example the usually I, i think maximum people have said it will load the image so that is the correct answer if you see in the ui it is not coming in the ui it is not coming but but in the network tab it is coming it is downloaded it is downloaded lot pic dot jpeg someone has given the right answer like fetches the images but it's not loading that is correct but do you think this is the correct way like this is the correct way uh to give the display none to the dev because we are not using it in the ui right but we are giving the extra call we are we giving the extra network call which is like slow down the uh, application so nowadays if you see right application has to be fast we are using so many things the minify minification then uglification then we are optimizing the images there were so many process to for the web performance thing so if you are not using this image then what will be the best approach to hide to to use a display none property so let's say we have another scenario if i use display none here so what will happen so in this scenario what will happen so i have added display none at this at the time of useless class so what will happen in this scenario it will load the image or it will not load the image so let's see okay someone has commented like might be used to the like it might be used to hide temporary let's see let's see what, what is happening so for example for example image is not there if you see right display none is there so image is image is not loaded but if you see the network call right it calls it calls in this scenario let's take another scenario let me let me add one for example high class then then what will happen in this scenario so what i have done i have not hide hide added the class display none in the in directly in the background uh, background class but i have added a container so what will happen in this scenario let's see the next quiz so what will happen in this scenario the same scenario useless class is there with the background image we are showing in the ui then we added a class height so what will happen in this scenario it will load the image in the network tab or it will not okay so few are saying like it will load and few are saying it will not so let's let's see what is happening so for example i have added a, i have added a class for example in this case i have added a display none so just observe what is happening if i made it as a offline right now it is not loaded so you, few are few guys are correct it will not load in the network call if if the parent container is hidden because in the dom if you see uh, the render render tree thing let me show you the render tree what is render tree so, so for example if we are having some html and css so what is happening as soon as html loads in the browser it will create a tree a dom tree right we know about the dom tree but in the case of css as well it will also create a tree like for the css css elements but after that what is happening they merge the dom tree and the css tree like a render tree if you see right this span is not there in the dom because they have a display none so render tree is what we have a concept of reflow and replane in the ui we design we draw every element in the ui once this process is done so the same thing in our scenario if you see display none is there in the parent thing so it is not there in the dom for the render tree it is it is there in the dom but is it is not there in the render tree so what will happen if if someone goes offline at that time what will happen if someone goes offline at that time and suppose you have some toggling option in the ui toggling option means you have some toggle thing if you do untoggle if you see right image is not coming because internet got disconnected and again 
it will go for another call because at that time image was not present so we have to identify what is the business scenario do we have a toggling thing if we have a toggling thing then we should not use the same thing we should not use this approach we should use some other approach but if we have if we want to hide the things this is the best approach to use just create a parent container and add some uh, display none class to that then let me make it online so let's take another scenario one so let's take another scenario so this is this is simple right we have another approach we have another approach like this image src thing so tell me in this scenario what will happen it will it will load so this is this is a simple scenario we have a hidden class we have image i'm loading image now as a uh, as like image attribute so what will happen now it will load the image or it will not load the image so earlier we have seen right it is it is not loading the image so sundar has said yes and suma has said not load it people are saying not load so most of the people are saying not load so this is a trickiest thing so if you see in the ui in the ui it is not coming in the ui it is not coming if you see image is there let's see the network call what happened so in the background browser loads the images uh, even if it is like display none even it is like if it is not there it doesn't matter image tag is overriding the property of display none even if your parent to parent to parent if any parent is having a display none property it is it is like it is it doesn't matter to the image tag so why it is happening so which one to use we we should use the css approach or we should use the image approach so let's let's make it uh, offline let's make it offline suppose our why i'm making this offline because we should know it is going for a network call or not so for example if i if i make it as a toggling thing so for example if i make it toggling image is coming fine and if you observe right it is not giving any extra network call because already the image is there so if your image or if your any content is a, is on the priority thing if you are using some toggling approach so you should use the image approach that's why people are saying use the image approach if you are following this instead of css part because in the css part automatically css loads if that css uh, class is there in the dom automatically it will load depends on the if display none is not there so this is one of the approach so that's all for the image side so i hope you learned something and you got something so let me make it online again so most of you if you are able to see right why 304 is coming and if i am toggling again and again right there is a there is an important thing if i am toggling again and again why it is not giving an extra call because it is taking from a cache if you see 304 is there right it is saying not modified because it is taking from a cache if you do empty cache or hard reload it will go for 200 so this is what a browser is having a capability if you if something is loaded as an images with external resources it is not uh, it is not doing an extra call so if i refresh again it is it is it will say like 304 i have not made a new request i have taken it from a cache so let's let's move to the next quiz so this is something interesting like uh, if you guys are aware of constructor function let me let me show you like what is constructor function so for example i hope you guys are getting what i am trying to explain yeah it is pretty good i see a lot of participants so, yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's let's see what is happening so constructor function is a way to create an object so for example we have a foo function then we have one property name and i am calling this func constructor function uh, via new keyword so what will happen it will create a new object we can create this new object multiple times by using the constructor function let's let's take an example of a basic thing so what if i console it right it is like tom is coming so if i console again foo is coming so the question is for example behind the scene what is happening let me explain you what is happening there is a implicit this there is a implicit this this like they create an object called this then they are map attaching some properties to the this variable and at the end it is returning this this object 
right so this is happening like behind the scene in the constructor function if you have seen the constructor function earlier because if you are using angular or react definitely you have seen this for the interviews thing or if you use, if you use create the application from vanilla javascript so what is happening if i return something manually what will happen so the question is let let's start with this so what will happen if you if you do if you do this it will print 3 it will give error or it will uh, like it will print something else anything so somebody has said it will ignore returns some are saying it will return 3 so maximum are saying return 3 because i am just printing object so in this case maybe we will discuss this later because 3 is not having a name property so let's start with uh, with this scenario so i will explain you like 3 uh, is a number right and number is a primitive thing so what is happening with the constructor function as soon as i run it right let me run it again as soon as i run it right so it is returning the same object because it is not having any impact like you can say it is of no use if you return anything externally so this is what is happening if the constructor function if you try to return anything on the constructor function but what will happen let's say so what will happen in this scenario it will throw an error or it will ignore or it will print again the tom whatever uh, it is printing previously so what is happening in this scenario in the constructor function okay few few are saying mike few are saying tom so let's let's run this let me clear the console and let's run this maximum was saying tom so in this scenario why it overrides the name like why it's override that this keyword i said right implicitly there is a this automatically it is there like in the constructor function automatically they are returning the this keyword but it is happening in the case of primitive so i am i am hoping like you guys are aware of primitive thing so primitive is what like string numbers boolean all these are primitive and uh, non primitive are like object uh, object where we pass the reference so this is what the object is if you return the non primitive thing it will override the existing thing so if you see right Uh, mike is coming because we override the existing thing because we are passing the non primitive so this is the catch in like uh, constructor function so this is the catch in the constructor function if you pass any anything like any primitive thing boolean if you pass boolean again it will it is it ignores the return if you pass anything like string it it it, it ignores but if you pass anything like object non primitive thing it is like override the existing thing so we should not add any any kind of return in the in constructor function but if you call the same thing like uh, like this not as an object not as an object but directly as a function now it it will return 3 without new it will return only non primitive if if someone has added explicitly in case of the normal calling the function it will return only primitive type so there is this is a catch in the constructor function that's why this question is pretty much popular in in the interview questions so let's move to the next question so let's see what what is there in this scenario so we have uh, use strict i am i'm hoping like uh, you must uh, aware of this use strict use strict is like uh, it is it will not allow a variable without declaration it will uh, there were so many things with the use strict so let's see in this scenario what is happening so we have a where x equal to 7 then x equal to 8 then x i am consoling x so what will be the output it will it will print 7 it will print 8 it will print undefined or any error because this x may can be an undefined and is this syntax correct in this scenario with the use strict or without use strict so in this scenario what what will happen So few are saying like error few are saying eight so let's let's see uh, let's break it down why let's see why not undefined why eight why seven let let's see by running it so maximum was saying error let's see so let's rewrite the same thing let's rewrite the same thing do use strict is there if we use comma it looks like this 
where x is equal to 8 then where x and I'm consoling so it looks like this this line is not uh, wrong it's correct if we have a comma this this is like declaration with the where so this is 7 this is 8 this is right x now tell me what will what can be the output like whatever whosoever said x like error 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 is not the case this is a perfect example it is it works fine so whosoever it, uh, says uh, that right error is there now try like what can be the uh, output it is undefined or something else okay so let's see what is happening let's let's run this in the js fiddle and see uh, what is happening let's run this if you see 8 is coming why 8 is coming let me explain this can be undefined also so right now if you see the value of x if you see right this value is not defined with x this is just a declaration so with use strict with use strict we can declare x multiple times that's not an issue use strict use strict will not stop you to declare uh, x multiple times uh, someone has uh, said correct so what will happen if we see this code right it will do hosting it will declare variables on the top then it will assign the value after that so in the last it will remove this line so if you see this code right now you can understand like why it is coming this is the reason why it is coming because this is a shorthand of writing this code to like this where x because of hosting it moves to the top this x moves to the top because of hosting then we assign to the 7 then we assign to 8 that's why 8 is coming so use strict if you if you without where if you use then it will throw an error this is one of the error that this is one of the case like it will say uncaught reference error because x is not defined so it is sometimes it is confusing people are, are confused with this syntax because this is the shorthand of uh, writing multiple declaration with the same variable so let's move to the next quiz so this is pretty much uh, related to uh, reference thing local variable and global variable so let's start with the uh, fourth line so there is sunny, an uh, sunny one thing at around 130 that was actual estimated completion what i'll do is i'll just take two minutes at 130 I will flash a poll. Uh, okay. Once people do the poll, we'll resume. I think there are many people who are interested. Uh, talk yes. is going on great. I'll okay. just take a two minute poll and then we'll continue. Is that okay? Anything is fine. Like I'll take only five minutes. My uh, five minutes, two, two quizzes are there. You can talk after that also. Sure, sure. Okay, then go ahead. Let's yeah, finish. Then we'll do it. I'll... Good. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So in this quiz, what is happening? There is an object which is in const point, point uh, to be remembered. Like this is a const variable. So name is Tom, then the second function, uh, if you see function is there, we pass the reference. I call this function, I pass this fourth line. If you see, I, I pass this object from here. Tom is passing. Then what I have done, I have update this variable. I have updated this reference, name Mike, then I, again I have changed to the Ross. So according to you, what will should be the output? It should print Tom, it should print Ross, or it should print Mike. So according to you, like, uh, what should be the output? Okay. Somebody has said like Ross, then few are saying Tom. So, so guys, you can open your mic, like why Tom? Anyone, if, if uh, anyone is like, why Tom? Okay, few are saying error, type, type error because of their thinking constant. Let, let's 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 uh, run this yeah if anyone is speaking okay okay let's let's take this scenario one second Let's run this. 
so what what i have done so what i have done i have just reanalyzed so let's let's uh, run this it will give you tom why tom let me explain you so guys what i have done i have just swapped the statements now tell me what will, what can be the output then it will be easy for you to understand why ross and why tom is coming so in this scenario what will happen i have just swapped the two two things okay so let let's check the first scenario tom is coming that is correct so why tom is coming let's let's understand this this thing object is a global it's a global variable right then we pass the reference we pass the reference if you observe we pass the reference to local variable object so this is a local variable to that function what i have done instead of modification this local variable i reinitialized it and this object is referring to a local variable and this object is referring to a local variable that's why uh, my uh, sorry uh, tom is coming because we have not changed anything on the global thing but the same scenario if i swapped it in this scenario what is happening i changed in the reference then i reassigned to the local variable so if you see console.log object this is what a local variable this is local variable and this is global variable if you run like this right mike is coming because we have local variable and global variable we have updated like a ross so this is what the quiz is i'll share the slide after this meetup let's let's try with this what can be the output in this scenario this is the last quiz after that like we can end up uh, with the q a what what can be the output so there is a function we have a try catch we have i am returning something from a try then we have a finally so basically what is happening finally executes in the last okay so after try and catch finally will executes uh, every time if this function is executing so from try i have written the 3 and finally i have written the 4 so if you see what can be the output if i call this function 3 4 undefined or error two people have said 3 3 is already executed function is removed from the stack okay so so gorav like what will be the output according to you maximum i think almost everyone is saying 3 let's let's run this uh, let's run this uh, code snippet so i am calling this function uh, let's see what is happening as soon as i run it right it is coming 4 so this is a weird thing with try and try and finally even if i am returning from 3 it should it should remove from the call stack i i'm hoping like you are aware of the call stack and uh, basically from the call stack so it should remove the control it should remove the control from this function and it should come on the 10th line right but what is happening finally executes in the last why finally we should use we should use for some clean up thing basically in every language finally is having this same role to clean up the garbage collection thing if we want to some remove some allocation but what is happening in javascript if you return anything on finally it will override this try return i hope like i think this is the only quiz everyone is wrong so <laughs> so it it's nice like people are participating so uh, so what is happening we should not use this is not a good practice like we should not a good practice to return something from uh, from finally we all we should if you want some data create some variable like this create some variable here create some variable and attach something or as a error or error object error or something but not do not return anything because it will override the thing so last quiz uh, it's a uh, like people are interacting so this is the last oh shit trans <laughs> so tell me the output one is less than two is less than three right so according according to you uh, it it is it will it should true so it is coming true let's reverse it 3 is greater than 2 is greater than 
that is also true right because 3 is greater than true 2 and 2 is greater than 1 let's run it it is false why it is coming false because of coercion is if you see it executes 3 is greater than 2 which is true which is true and if you see true is 1 and 1 is greater than false which is false that's why it is coming false so yeah that's it guys for these quizzes i hope you liked it I, we are running out of time so we can like discuss this in the group if you are interested if you have any other quizzes if you have a quiz like this like we can discuss in the group we have chats and you can connect me on the social things yeah. Yep. Thank you so much. Thanks, sure. Petro. Thanks, Anadhan, for the opportunity. This yeah, we, we still have we still have two to five minutes uh, for uh, people to ask questions or also you know express their thanks uh, to all the speakers. Uh, yeah. You can unmute yourself and talk. In the meantime, please also take a few minutes. It's just a one click per question. Please go ahead and take the poll. That will help us uh, collect feedback and also we share this feedback with the speakers. That way, you know, uh, they get uh, encouraging uh, response from the participants. Please take a minute for all the hard work speakers have done. Thank you. Uh, you can unmute yourself, ask questions, give comments, suggestions. Please go ahead. Yes, guys, if you have any questions, please go ahead. In any yeah. other yeah. Yes, Ali, it was very useful session. I saw it was very interactive. So, uh, guys, it's not only for Sunny. If you ask question to any of our speakers, you can ask. Uh, so, we will be on for five minutes. So, anybody have question for Aman or Bharat or Sunny? Uh, you can ask. I think Nitis has something else, so he left. Uh, so maybe you can post post question uh, to our meetup chair also uh, if he can answer over there. Yeah. Once the recording is available, uh, you know I will upload it on YouTube also share the link. Uh, even the last sessions is pending. I will do that. Any other suggestions? Please post in the chat window, or you can ask right now. Thank you. Uh, Sunny, Manoj, uh, I have a question. Okay. Uh, Sunny, you also conduct uh, trainings? Uh, yes. Uh, I see your site. I mean, uh, there is a site, DV. Dev code, yeah. Okay. Is uh, I mean, is it uh, is it been taken care completely by you or how is it? I mean, uh, uh, you are yeah. a trainer. Uh, we have a team like from a backend front end, uh, from a backend side, from a cloud side, from a UX team. So basically, when we have a requirement, so we are sending the guys to colleges for free sessions as well. Mm -hmm. so this is what just I created a website so that people, if, if anyone is interested, they can contact me. So in colleges, usually we do for free. Right now, it's online thing, right? So if anyone is interested in learning, we are going for sessions online. Uh, Sunny, uh, I'm interested in JavaScript, uh, but when I try uh, and visit your site, it's, it's not taking me further. I mean, if I click on the JavaScript course, if I'm not wrong. Uh, nothing is there actually. This is just a, a course content. It is under process. Mm -hmm. So you can, you can. There is an email ID or there is a contact. You can contact me anytime. So I'll, I'll share the further details. It depends on the crowd. If it is for co corporate thing, then the course content is different because then we have to think about performance and all. If it is like college, we have to go for the basic things. If it is interview thing, then we have to go for other process so these are so many things depend on the crowd so i have chosen this like a uh, quiz section because the crowd is a mixed thing few are a uh, interviewer few are like uh, candidates so that's why i ask these questions okay so if i if i need to learn the basics of javascript do you offer anything uh i'll i'll, I'll we have a group right uh, js meetup vlr in that in telegram i'll share a few posts uh, common courses which we have online free i'll share some links over there or if you want anything else, maybe we can connect it half like uh, after this. Uh, okay, uh, Sunny, is it possible for you to share your number or something so that I can reach you after this? You can you can connect me LinkedIn. Uh, from there we can uh, share my number. Okay, done, 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 Sunny. So guys, any question? Maybe two more minutes. Uh, we'll wind it up. I would like to you know, thank uh, deepsource.io. Uh, the, the sponsorship they are giving and supporting us is great. Uh, thanks for voluntarily coming forward. Also, Aman Sharma, uh, last time as a well distance speaker. Uh, thanks, guys, for all the support. Appreciate it greatly. Thank you for having us. Thank you, man. Yeah.
Yeah, thank you to all speakers as well. Uh, it was really awesome talks. Uh, Nitis, Aman, Bharat, and Sunny. It was all wonderful talks today. Yeah, thanks, yes. Patrick, and thanks, Anadan. Okay, so Janardhan, then we can close it off. I think looks like uh, we yes. don't have any question anymore. Oh, good. Yes. Oh, okay. Thanks, Vijay. So you guys can follow us on Twitter. Anyway, we'll be posting all our links over there. So you can get to know our recordings and next session details. If you want to speak, you can uh, you post. The links are there. So you can submit your talk over there. OK. People can drop off. I will end the session in a minute or so. I will end the poll and then end the session. Thank you so much, guys. Have a good day. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.